Hi everyone, um, at the University of Bonn and TIFR Mumbai. He was the Dean's Fellow at University of Pennsylvania, as well as the CERN Asia Fellow in 2006. For all the pop science aficionados out there, Professor Govindrajan's main research interest is in the area of superstring theory, along with quantum field theory and mathematical physics. Apart from his obvious love for all things physics, Professor Govindrajan is also an avid sports fan and a regular marathon runner, logging in a whopping 2,000 kilometers a year. Uh, that's going to be a hard record to meet this year, isn't it, Professor? Uh, well, I just touched 2,000 kilometers yesterday oh, for okay. the year. <laughs> well, yeah, at least the pandemic isn't stopping you at all. Yeah, yeah it keeps me sane. <laughs> no, that's great. So, uh, shall we start, sir? Yeah. So good afternoon everybody. So uh, today I, I want to talk about uh, undergrad, undergraduate research, whether it's a myth or reality. And this is based on an experience I've had with the Partitions Project. Interestingly, I gave this talk three years ago to the faculty of IIT Madras, a similar title, slightly different content, and, but the audience is very different. So this is aimed towards undergraduate students. And so let's so the plan of my talk is as follows. Uh, can you see my cursor? Yes, yeah, sir. Is my yeah, ah, yeah, okay, good. Accessible. So, uh, okay, start with some history, then introduction to the uh, problem, and then the partitions project, and then uh, a few more. Hadi Ramanujam Radhamakar formula, they shouldn't have been as a special section, but that's okay. And then I'll discuss some open problems. Okay, so let me start. So uh, the, the, the one of the things which uh, I learned over the years as a teacher is that uh, students have forgotten how is the joy of learning. So this has to do with our educational system where a premium is placed on performance in examinations. The focus is on doing well in exams and that carries over to working only for good grades as undergraduates. Okay, And there is absolutely no joy in the process of learning in the process of discovering some obscure piece of knowledge. Okay, somehow this is completely forgotten. And so around 2005, uh, out of frustration, I should say, I started a group consisting of students with the sole goal of rediscovering the joy of learning. The idea was that we would meet every week and one person, not necessarily me, and it wasn't me, would present something to the rest of the group. And the uh, students chose a name Boltzmann, and we formed a Yahoo group, by the way, Yahoo group to communicate with each other. And let me remind you, there was no Gmail, definitely no Gmail groups, no Google groups, nothing. Okay. So we started off with some, with a theme, which was to study something called uh, an exact solution of Onsagar for the two-dimensionalizing model. And it took us, you know, all semester to understand the solution. So it was a long process. We broke it up into bits and pieces. And this group continued to function until a few years ago. It lasted more than 10 years. And Horizon IATM actually has restarted the series and uh, they kept the name. So thanks to them. And now we come to our topic, is undergraduate research even possible? Okay. And there's a background to my thinking about this. And this has to do with how graduate schools, at least in physics and in the US, are expecting students to author research publications as undergraduates. It's no longer enough for you to do well in your courses, have good GRE scores and good letters of recommendation. And I suspect I may not make it to the school where I did my PhD today. Okay. So my research area, however, uh, is string theory is fairly esoteric and it takes years of training to even understand the statement of a problem. So that's one reason I 
cannot get involved with undergraduates doing research. I mean, there might be exceptions, but it's very rare. And also students at IITM, so that's from the faculty viewpoint. From the student viewpoint, they fall into two categories. One category is I don't care about research. And then there are others who are into building, uh, see what I call CV building. And they will think that, oh, a research paper or working under some prof will look good on my CV. I mean, these two categories are people I, I wouldn't know what to do with, both of them. And so both sides need to compromise to make undergraduate research work. So I started looking for problems to work on where motivated undergraduates would learn to do research. And I would emphasize to the students that they would not get a research paper, and this is mostly true if they work with me, okay? So what that does is those guys who are building CVs will disappear. So uh, it works very well. And at the end of the day, luckily, the, I mean, there are students who don't fall into the two categories. Obviously, there are exceptions. And so, there, so yeah, maybe it is possible. So this led to the birth of the partitions project. And I started looking for problems which I call are easy to state, but hard to solve. Then I had in my own work, I had come across something called solid partitions of positive integers, of which very little seemed to be known. So I posed this problem to uh, the uh, students attending the Boltzmann group. And the problem was simple. It said, write a program to compute P3 of n. So there's a bunch of numbers for every n. There's a number for all n less than or equal to 100. We'll define P3 of n in the later part of this talk. And, uh, you know, by then I had been in IIT long enough that I expected nobody to do anything. You know, that's uh, kind of, call it, my wife calls me cynical. So maybe I'm cynical, yeah. So I did not expect anybody to even write a program. But pretty much within a week, uh, one student, a sophomore, he was a second year dual degree physics student, implemented an algorithm due to Knuth within a week. Okay. But the program worked. Definitely it worked. But... Uh, it couldn't even, it could not compute P3 of 51. The reason I'm uh, looking at 51 is that the numbers up to 50 were known. So 51 would be the first new number that would have added to that sequence. Okay, so let's now get to the introduction to this problem. So at this point, none of these, uh, I mean, what is P3 of N? I have not defined it. So let's get to defining some things so that we can understand what this problem is about. Okay, so we start with a game. And hopefully you can see there is a kind of a, a two lines this way. It's like a wedge. So we live in a 2D space and these are like walls. And I stop, I start dropping squares. Okay. Square pieces of some unit size. All of them are identical. So I start like this. Here's the first one. And gravity acts downwards. So the first one comes uniquely. There's only one way of putting that in. What about now I put a second piece. Second piece can come like this. It can also come like this, but this is not allowed because if you jiggle it, it'll either fall to the right or the left. So there are two configurations with two pieces. Okay, so now here is a configuration with four pieces. Okay, so is this clear? So let's move on. So now what you do is fix the number of pieces and ask how many distinct stable configurations exist. Okay, so if you take four, you should see that there are five configurations. This is one I just showed you, but there are, uh, you know, four other configurations which are possible and they're all stable configurations, okay? And uh, so depending on your area of specialization, you might recognize young diagrams drawn Russian style, directed compact lattice animals. I don't expect any of you to recognize all these things, but definitely some of you would have played this old game, which, you know, in my younger age, we used to play called Tetris. So you should uh, see that, uh, you know, five, these are five of the uh, pieces which appear in Tetris. There are other ones which are not by our rules. So they should at least remind you of the game of Tetris. Okay. So we'll, def we'll now look at something else, a different. So, so far, we just saw that, you know, from our previous uh, thing, we saw that for two, there are two configurations. Say so, so for four, there are five configurations. So, uh, so this is what we got in this game. But now we'll do a different problem. This is going to be a mathematical problem. So it's it's called a partition of a non... You give me a non-negative integer n greater than 0. So n is 1, 2, 3. And uh, so it's a partition is uh, of a non-negative integer n is to express it as a sum of positive integers. 
So if you look at this, 2 plus 1 plus 1 is a partition of the integer 4. But of course, 1 plus 2 plus 1 is also a partition of the this thing, and we don't want to distinguish these two. So what we do is we put them in decreasing order. Okay, so weakly decreasing, that means the next two guys, uh, I mean, the guy, as you move to the right, it can be the same or it can go, it can, and reduce. So once we put that condition in, we see that 2 plus 1, 1, uh, 2, 1, 1 is the unique way of writing. So we get a unique representative. So now the question is, you want to, you, the, uh, the goal here is you give me an N and you want to ask how many such distinct dec weakly decreasing sequences can we write? So, and let P of N denote the number of partitions of N. So this, each of these is called a partition of N. So for N equal to four, one has four, which is, uh, has one part, three, one has two parts, two, 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 one, one, which we just saw and four ones. So then a uh, little bit of thought will tell you that there are exactly five of them. So P of four is five and P of N is called the partition function. Okay. In physics, partition function means something else. This is number theoretic partition function. So now the question is, is there a coincidence that this is the same number of configurations that we obtained in our game? Remember, we got five exactly here and this thing. So now here is a nice uh, combinatorial trick. If you have two sets which have the same counting problem, what you can do is if you want to show that they are the same in some sense, you've got to give me a bijective map. That means you give me one element of one set, will give me a unique element of the other set. And we'll see that bijection in a moment. So here's how we go. So we go from partitions to Young diagrams. And so you're given a partition. So now there's just a A1, A2, A3. It's a weakly decreasing sequence. It's going to have some finite number of entries, of course. But we're just writing it this way. And draw a Young diagram with AK boxes in the game. What's a Young diagram? So you start like this. So it's better to look at an example. 3, 1. So you draw uh, three boxes in the first row, one box in the second row. 2, 1, 1 will be two boxes in this thing, first row second, one, one, and you align them along this. So you can see that if you rotate this by 135 degrees, these start looking like those Tetris-like pieces. So we get a nice uh, way. So we can go from left to, so let's look at this. Four means four in the first row. So you can, you can see, you can go back and forth. So we have a unique uh, mapping between the partitions of integers and these diagrams, which we'll call them Young diagrams. And it is clear that this map is a bijection. So given a Young diagram, one can obtain the corresponding partition by counting the number of boxes in each row. So now we are on to generalizations of this. Okay. And here the, the this definition of it as a weakly decreasing sequence is something which you should remember. And so let's do that. So McMahon actually generalized this, a two-dimensional uh, a plane partition of a non-negative integer n is a two-dimensional array or a matrix of non-negative integers a, i, j. So we start, we start, I start labeling from 0, a, 0, 0, a, 0, 1, so on and so forth, a, 1, such that it's weakly decreasing in both directions, so both the horizontal and the vertical. If you go vertically downwards, it should decrease, if you go to the right, it should decrease. This is what it means, this condition I've written, and the sum of all the entries should be equal to n. So this clearly generalizes what we have. And let P subscript 2 denote uh, of n denote the number of plane partitions of n. So now we can just go ahead and look at the plane partitions of 4. So first let us look, look, look at the entries in black 4, 3, 1, 2, 2, 2, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. These were exactly what we saw as uh, out here as the partitions of uh, one dimension, we'll call the one dimensional partitions, or ordinary partitions. Now I can rotate these guys a little bit. So you see that you get the blue guys, 3, 1, 2, 2, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1. So in some sense, they are uh, similar to the other ones. And then you get other guy, other possibilities, because you can grow in two directions. These are all things growing either in the horizontal or in the vertical direction. Well, here we have the ones in red, which grow in both directions. Okay. And you can see, if you sit and add all these things, we'll find that P2 of 4 is 13. Okay. So now we can ask, can we do some visual stuff? And the answer is yes. But li like we saw that when we had a line guy, uh, ordinary partitions, we, were, we got a two-dimensional object called uh, like these, the Young diagram. So we'll get some analog of it, three-dimensional Young diagrams. And so just imagine this to be an 
empty room and now uh, uh, with uh, three walls which have colored differently and uh, then we start putting instead of putting squares we start putting cubes of some unit size so it's the first so let's go back sorry so i can put the first cube and gravity acts if you wish along the one 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 plane so like it's, it pulls it to the corner so that's one unique way so now we let's we can put a second guy here now you can see there are three ways of putting the second guy i could put it on top or on the other side but okay yeah, i could have put it here i could also have put it here okay so here you can see that this uh, this young diagram a 3d young diagram represents the plane partition to one one. Okay, it's clear how to generalize young diagrams to higher dimensional higher dimensions. You just replace cubes with, in 3D to hypercubes in 4D and so on, so on. But of course, visualization is clearly not possible. So it's better to think of it in a slightly different way. So we'll give an alternate definition now. So and that uh, that uses a variant of young diagrams, and these are called Ferrer's diagrams. So what we do is we replace the squares we saw in partitions or cubes in plane partitions with integral points in the positive orth end. So you just look in the positive, uh, this, you know, R plus means so you just from zero to infinity to the, you know, the Cartesian product of that. And you replace all these squares by points, or we call the points nodes. Okay, so now I can give you a different definition. Uh, unrestricted d dimensional so now d equal to 1 will be partitions d equal to 2 will be plane partitions and this was 3 onwards will be higher dimensional solid then so on so unrestricted d dimensional partition is a collection of n points or nodes in an integer lattice which is in the positive orthant satisfying the property so suppose so now it's in d plus 1 dimensions so you just uh, coordinate that will be a1 a2 up to ad plus 1 transpose of course so you look at this, then all nodes x with x1 to xd plus 1 such that uh, all the xi's lie between 0 and ai are also belong to the set, belong to it. So I, I don't know why this break has come, but this just should come here. Okay, so for instance, the following one dimensional partition of 4, so you can say there is 2, 0 here, 0, 2 here. So looking at this thing, 0, 1 and 0, 0 should be there. So 0, 1 is there, this thing is there. 1, 0 is there. So, what is what can be below that? 0, 0. So, these are the supports. So, there is a gravity condition translated into some kind of uh, uh, supporting node kind of story. And so, you can just write these things. So, you can also write it in some compressed form. 0, 0. This is a coordinate of the first node, second node, third node, fourth node. Okay. Same collection of nodes can be viewed as points now. So, this you take as coordinate. So, this is 0, 0. Okay, and say this is the, this would be 0, 1, sorry, this would be 1, 0, this would be 0, 1, and 0, 2. Okay, this is x2 coordinate in this, or you can replace these uh, dots by squares and you can recover the young diagram. So, this is what we call a Ferrer's diagram. So, this, so we have three different representations of the same thing, 3, 1, or this Ferrer's diagram with four nodes, or young diagram with four uh, squares. Okay. As in any counting problem, we would like to enumerate PDN, the number of d-dimensional, distinct d-dimensional partitions of n. However, the numbers grow too fast for explicit en enumeration. For instance, just take P1 of 200 or P of 200, that is a number which is of the order of 10 power 12. Okay, so standard methods exist to tackle such problems. One of them is a method of generic functions, the other is recursion relations. But this may not work in all cases, as we'll see. For instance, in the early part of the 20th century, Macmon enumerated by hand, by the way, the first 200 values of P of n using an efficient recursion relation, which is the second entry here due to Euler. Okay. So, if standard methods such as these don't work, what does one do? So, let's look at the generating function. So, what you do is, so you just define P, uh, uh, we know what P of 1, etc., P of 2, P of 3, P of 4 is for instance 4. 5, sorry. So, you can just uh, define P of 0 to be 1 and then uh, form this function of Q, which is summation n equal to 0 P of n Q power n. Okay. So, these, uh, some of you might know about convergence. We are not thinking, these are, this is what is called a formal power series. We are not worried at this point about convergence. 
But there's a beautiful formula due to Euler, which says that P of Q has this infinite product structure. So it's a product. Let's look at this. 1 by a uh, product from m equal to 1 to infinity of 1 minus q power n. So you can go ahead and if and you can see that uh, there is some convergence if uh, so in this formula at least for mod q less than 1 this can be converges okay. But uh, like I said we think of it as a power series but this uh, formula is a beautiful formula and let us see how it works for p of 4. So what I am going to do here is to show, so you just, uh, uh, hopefully you know the generalized binomial theorem which says that 1 by 1 minus x is equal to 1 plus x plus x square plus x cube, no factors, no signs, nothing, it's a simple thing. So the first term in this product is just 1 by 1 minus q, so that is 1 plus q plus q square plus q cube, but I write q square as 1 plus 1 to remind me that it came from the expansion of 1 by 1, oh, one, up, one over 1 minus q. Similarly, I can do this for the, the second term in this will be m equal to 2, which would be 1 plus q square plus q power 4, which I write now as q power 2 plus 2, okay. And similarly for q cube, q power 4. And I'm just throwing away terms because I'm interested in p power 4. If uh, you can see from this side that uh, if q power 5 is there, that's going to contribute to p5. So we are not interested in p5, we want to know p4. Okay? So you can see here that one way of getting it is to consider 1, 1, 1 and q power. So this is one of those things. We can identify this with the partition 4. Here's the second one. This would be 1, 3. And let's not look at the ones because they are not. So this would be the partition 3, 1. Here's the other one. This will be 2, 2. And 2, 1, 1. And the last one will be 1, 1, 1. So you see we get all the five of them. So a little bit of thought will tell you formally that this guy will indeed give you what p of n. So this is a very simple proof which uh, I think uh, most uh, first year undergraduates should be able to prove. Okay. So now just following this thing we try to define a generating function pd of q which is just again pd of 0 you define to be 1 and you sum the rest. You get again some formula. McMahon conjectured and uh, conjectured not proved okay, immediately uh, that the generating function of plane partitions is given by P2 of Q, which is the same product, but instead of minus 1, you put an N. Okay, but this, like I gave you an easy proof here, no such elementary proof is known. It took McMahon 20 years to prove this. But this formula, once you know the generating function, you can write some kind of recursion relation, and this is a nice way to, uh, this might be a faster way to evaluate these things rather than going ahead and taking this and doing the Taylor expansion about q equal to 0 and expanding, getting the coefficient. So if you want 100, you could in principle take this formula, this second formula, expand it in some Mathematica or Maple or any program, you know, uh, and uh, Python or whatever, SymPy or whatever, and ex extract the coefficient of q power 100. But that's, uh, that usually tends to be slow. This is slightly better. So we can, in principle, define these generating functions, but the question is, will they have some simple formula? And McMahon actually, he was, uh, he got Beaver, he wrote a formula and he put some kind of binomial factor and uh, said that I conjectured that this was true for d greater than d. But it was shown in 1967 that this fails. So let's just call this series, which he gets as MD of n, m for McMahon mb of n is not equal to pd of n for d greater than 2 and for n greater than 6. So it fails at n equal to 6, for instance, for p3. So the so now here we have a case where a generating function doesn't work. If you don't have a generating function, you cannot write some kind of recursion relation. So that it's like nothing is known. So, so here's a stay after McMahon. It was really the first serious computation. Uh, appeared more, many, many years later in 1967, that's due to Atkin, Bradley, and McDonald and Mackay. Of these three are big name mathematicians, and Bradley is a big name in uh, computer science. And uh, so, the thing is that they wrote this paper, and uh, and uh, so here's what in the McDonald had to say about the about the uh, how the paper was received. In the words of the third author, the paper landed like a lead balloon but they look genuinely interesting. So, but it really nothing happened. And Stanley, who has done, he's a famous communitarist at MIT, 
And in his 1971 doctoral thesis, the case R equal to 2 as well-developed theory, here two-dimensional partitions are known as plane partitions. C21 and the survey by Stanley for results on plane partition. For R greater than or equal to 3, almost nothing is known. And some proposition casts only a faint glimmer of light on a vast darkness. So this is a table which I have from the 1967 paper of Atkin et al. Not only were they, you know, very interesting people, they also were one of the earliest programmers. They used to program by taking cards to a, a computer center and submitting it. So they actually sat down and did some computations. And they got some numbers. Okay. And you can see how sparse these entries are. You might think, huh, why not I get P6 of 16? Okay. These would have been putting the computer to the limits, at least those computers. Okay. So the case of 3 equal to uh, D equal to 3 is called solid partitions. So one can attempt to carry out exact enumerations. So Bratley and Mecca actually came up with an algorithm which they used to get this uh, table. And there's another one due to Knut. And Knut's algorithm enumerates something else called topological sequences in a partially ordered set. And if you choose the set to be n power d, the number of topological sequences of something called a, of, a, of, of a given index, whatever that means, can be used to obtain the number of d-dimensional functions. So if you compute uh, this number of topological sequences, you can from that you can extract the number of d-dimensional partitions. And he actually went ahead and he extended uh, uh, the numbers to obtain the first 28 numbers. So if you see here, oops, sorry, let me just get back. Somehow it ended up at the last page. This is where I wanted to come. So if you look at uh, 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 things, so here they had stopped at 21 for uh, solid partition. So he extended it to 28 and into, so you can see there are huge decades go by before things are, uh, something happens. So this is extended to 50 by Mustonen and Rajesh and P3 of 50 is 10 power 13. It's a number of order of 10 power 13, and uh, so it's fairly big. So, this is what I asked. So, now I'm repeating what I had shown you before. I said write a program to enumerate P3 of n for n less than 100. And of course, P3 of 50 is known. So, at least if you're going to get a new number, it has to be P3 of 51. Okay. So, uh, the sophomore, he wrote a program, but it was not efficient, or it just it could not uh, it could not evaluate P3 of 51 as it stood. So, but now the question is, why bother enumerating solid partitions? And people ask me all these questions, okay. and uh, uh, so there are several answers. Oh, because they are there to be enumerated. There are structures and patterns that are waiting to be found, and a practical reason, which is the purpose of this talk, is the problem is very simple to state and is accessible to under, undergraduates. And this is the most important point. Their minds are uncluttered by too much knowledge and might open up fresh lines of thought. Uh, okay, and uh, so two and three actually, these two ideas uh, actually happened in this project. I didn't know that in 2010. I also like Doron Zeilberger's response to receiving the 1998 Steel Prize. Okay, so uh, Zeilberger is a very interesting person and uh, he, he writes papers with his uh, computer. And uh, given the computer name, his computer's name is Eckhard, Shalosh B. Eckhard, E-K-H-A-D. And he believes that you got to use computers and this thing. So, so his uh, statement is don't look down on any activity as inferior because two ugly parents can have beautiful children and a narrow-minded or a elitist, elitist attitude will lead nowhere. So he's, as you can see, he's a very, you know, as a Serbic person as well. But uh, this is, uh, so this is why we are going to uh, enumerate solid partitions. And uh, I have one more point. It's just fun. It's just, the idea here is to also have fun. So finally, a fresh line of uh, thought emerged. So, uh, so the first version of the code could evaluate P3 of 25 in reasonable time. And the student, his name is Srivatsan Balakrishnan. He graduated in 2014. 
and uh, so i suggested you see if you can parallelize it so we could do better so after several iterations very uh, many ideas you would come up with we did something and we actually with great difficulty we enumerated uh, p3 of 51 and 52 and feeling good about it but then uh, uh, you know i wanted p3 of 100 so but p3 of 60 looked impossible as if we tried to use this parallel code it would take decades to do the computation so uh, just when these results came out Stevenson came up with a break. Okay, so the problem with generating these numbers is that they grow very fast, and the programs at the end of the day are generating all solid partitions. So if you have the number of the order of ten power eighteen, you have to generate ten power eighteen, and you can see that that is not the way to go. Similar problem occurs in Knuth algorithm, where you generate a number of what are called topological sequences of a given index. So his. Oh, Whole idea was the following. He said, "Ah, I, you know, you you generate a sequence of say given length L, and then you can you can generate more sequences by adding terms to it, adding further things to it." So his idea was, "I'll generate it up to some point, and then uh, I will use those sequences uh, uh, to generate the other ones." So the but the catch here, the, the point is that there are many different sequences of say length uh, k. Which have uh, which differ only by some kind of permutation. So his point was, I don't need to use all of them. Yes, sir. We're back now. Sorry for the delay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I I heard that there was a yeah breakthrough break in network when I talked about breakthrough or something. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> sorry about it. So so the the observation of Srivatsan was that uh, that we don't have to run all sequences. Only uh, of some length, just uh, one from every permutation in a given class, and so that really uh, and reduce the rest of it to bookkeeping. And this simple observation is actually revolutionary. And it, let's look at numbers. So suppose you would try to work at depth eight, you would have to run your program. You would run, you know, seventeen thousand five hundred and eighty-nine different. So this is parallel. Each of them will do computations, and you collect the numbers and add them. And uh, but if you use this idea of Shivatsan, you just need 169. So you can see it's a huge uh, improvement. So if you go to depth 14, you have a number of the order of 10 power 9, but you just need 4,167. So we use this to compute P3 of 62. Okay, and the gain was of the order of 10 power 9 in number. Okay, and again, uh, yeah. So it was a gain of only 10 power 5. Sorry, not 10 power 9. There were 10 power nine jobs, but this was smaller by then. Eventually, in January 2013, we computed P3 of 72 by going to depth 21, where we had to submit 118,794 jobs. But that was still, you know, 10 power 10 times less than the actual number we would have to run. You know, and uh, so it took half a million CPU hours, and then we got all numbers, of course, up to 72. The largest we got was P3 of 72. Which was this huge number, and this could not have been achieved without this beautiful insight from an undergraduate student. Okay, but uh, as Richard Hamming said, the purpose of computation is insight and not numbers. So of course, uh, you know, when you're running jobs, you know, uh, so for instance, when we had uh, submitted uh, for 62, that time we the largest known number was 55, so we used that. And another undergraduate, Navin Prabhakar, who is from the class of 2011, he worked out the asymptotics of the wrong generating function of n. It takes this form where a, b, and c are not given the constants; they are some numbers, and we uh, know numbers. And then we fix this number by requiring q3, which is uh, so q3 of 55 to agree with p3 of 55. And then when we looked at the numbers, here's an example. We looked at Q3 of 62, which you use this formula and just round it, you get this number. But the actual exact answer was this, and you can see it's not really so bad. We, you know, the first 
not only getting the order right, the first four digits are also right. So this appeared to provide uh, evidence for a conjecture of Mustanen and Rajesh that the McMahon formula might give the, the Q3, Q3 of n will have the same large n behavior at large n as Q3. So this was remained. So we actually got excited. We wrote a paper on the asymptotic of high dimensional partitions and we generalized it for even other four or five, etc. And the point here is that there were several undergraduate students who wanted to help me towards improving the code, but it was usually passive. Only one person was active in the whole thing. And there were about four to five versions of the code. And in all these versions, I faced an uh, issue with reliability. There was no guarantee that the code was doing what it should. So I needed to spend a lot of time running checks, rewriting parts of the code. And in the process, I learned C++. And also, I noticed that several students showed enthusiasm to work on the project, but eventually dropped out. But once we have these results, what do you do with them, right? You can't, I mean, we of course, we published a paper. We shared a result with two groups. One is the online encyclopedia of integer sequences, where they, you can just submit your sequence. And we also submitted to a mailing list of fans of sequences. And once I did that, from uh, the sick fan list, one person named Paul Hanna, again, somebody I never met, I have never met since, he had a conjecture that there exists an integer triangle P such that the row sums of the matrix power of P power N forms the number, gives the number of N dimensional functions. And so by just using known numbers, he had worked out this thing, what this thing is, P um, should be. And, uh, and he asked me if I could prove this conjecture. Actually, I could. I could prove the existence of P as well as its integrality. And this came easily to me. But it, uh, it led me to such a much different question. It said the following. You fix a value of N and ask how many independent numbers are needed to compute PD of N for all D. So it, until now, what we were doing, we pick solid fraction partitions. That means we fix D equal to 3 and compute for different values of N. We are asking a different problem here. We are keeping n fixed and varying d. And the first case would be, ah, you need all of them are distinct and distinct. But if you think in terms of Ferrer's diagram, what you will realize is that only you need this for the first n minus 1 values of d. All other numbers are, can be determined. And that is done by means of this beautiful transform, which has nice group theory associated with it and combinatorics also. And uh, so I can't discuss it here, but what it says is that the data in PD of N is the same as AN of R, but AN of R, if you write this as a matrix, is a triangular matrix. So it looks like this. So these are all zeros. PD of N is not triangular, it goes off to infinity, but it says that you take this thing and if you do a transform of it, for every row you do the transform, you will get, uh, you will get PD of N. So you can see that if you go to this row, four or whatever, you get, uh, you know, you get uh, only three entries. So this is a fairly small thing. And uh, so this is what, uh, Bra you know, the uh, 1967 paper did. So it says, final conclusion is that you require n minus one non-zeros numbers in A and R to determine partitions of n in all dimensions. You know, you pick a row, you need only these numbers. And also it's very simple. You can see these ones are there. So we really need to know, we can prove these, some of these things. So, but I uh, so, but I knew that uh, that uh, was an overestimate, and uh, so it took me a year. But I came up with this completely weird-looking, bizarre transform. Bizarre, it remains bizarre. But once you understand it, it came. It's like I wrote the formula without uh, making a mistake because I knew what what I was expecting. And uh, then uh, you go ahead and uh, you look at this. Uh, uh, so this is also you write it as a matrix like we did the A guy and then you see that this has much fewer entries so the main result is the nth row of F has only n minus 1 upon 2 independent numbers in this case it was n minus 1 so really a factor of 2 is gained with this thing and so you can go ahead and determine all these F matrices and using this idea I actually be now uh, you know, you remember that I shared a table from Atkin. That table we know up to row 26 now. So we know if you give me a partition, I can tell you the partitions of 26 in any dimension. 
And if you go to this uh, page, which I will share at the end, you can actually enter the number and you will get the answer. Okay. Similarly, there was another email which I got who, from Nicola Dastanville, who saw my paper with Srivatsan and uh, Naveen. And he sa I said, look, uh, you guys are claiming a conjecture, but I have some other sort of similarly related results where it doesn't work. And I told him, no, 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 we just, it's still a conjecture. We have not provided proof. And he said, let's go ahead and recheck it. And we did something called Monte Carlo simulations. Again, using the IIT and HPCE. And we showed that it deviated in a very, very small manner. And there are some interesting results. So, but the conclusion is that everything about higher dimensional partition is hard. And, but I hope some undergraduate might do better. Okay, so, so the, now comes a beautiful formula due to Ramanujam, Hardy Ramanujam and Radamakar. And uh, so this, uh, this requires a little bit higher, higher level of mathematics. So if you remember, there was a generating function P of Q. And P of N, I said you pick the coefficient of Q power N, you will get P of N, but you can write it like a contour integral. Okay, and uh, so you take uh, the zero is uh, so you in the Q plane, think of Q as a complex number, and uh, in the Q plane, you try take a circle of radius rho which is less than one centered at the origin. The reason you want a center radius to be less than one is because P of Q we know, uh, you know, if you look at the product formula of Euler, you know that it blows up whenever you hit Q is some nth root of unity. Okay. So it has P of Q as poles on the unit circle. So, and uh, so whenever Q hits e power two pi i h bar upon k, you will start getting. And uh, so using that, you can do this integral through something called the saddle point method. So if you take the leading guy, you get this beautiful form. Okay, so this is just the contribution from uh, Q equal to one. Okay, next term would be Q equal to minus one and then third roots of unity and so on and so forth. And if you just plug this uh, 200 in, you get something which gets the order correct. But if you remember, this is not correct. This was three sign something. So Hardy and Ramanujam, they sat down and uh, they actually computed all contributions uh, from K root of unity and they got this beautiful formula. Okay, and there's some nicety here again. But uh, here's something very interesting. Hardy has to said about this. He said, at this point, we may have stopped had it not been for Major McMahon's love of computation. McMahon was a practiced and enthousi enthusiastic computer, and he made a table. There's some missing words here. Table of P of N up to N equal to 2. So they went ahead, and we naturally took this value, that is 200, to test their asymptotic formula. So they started writing those things. Asymptotic formula means it doesn't convert. Okay? So just adding terms, they took the first eight terms and they added it and lo and behold, they got the exact answer. Okay, and the error was added, it was only 0 0.004, but we know P of N is an integer. Okay, and, uh, but, uh, so the point here is that uh, this formula uh, due to Hardy and Ramanujam was asymptotic and exact. Then Radamarker actually improved on it and he showed, he did some tweak and uh, he actually showed that this formula can be made convergent. And so it became an exact formula. So after some, what it says, if you start adding other terms, they are very small and can be neglected. So you actually have an exact formula. Now, it's pretty amazing people. Somebody has computed P of 10 power 20 using this formula. And uh, so his name is Friedrich Johansson. And this is something worth uh, People who are in computer science will also show that, he, uh, uh, you know, he does lots of uh, uh, interesting things. For instance, uh, if you go to this formula, what you have is that uh, the as k increases, uh, the terms, uh, they contribute less, right? So he uses sliding precisions, etc. So he does some lot of clever tricks and he actually computed this. And the answer is some huge and required. <laughs> So, but Naveen and I said, we, we know the generating function for uh, plane partitions and it looks similar to that. So, can we use some method? So, we built on a work of Armquist and we wrote a Hardy Ramanujam Radamakar like formula, but it's much more of uh, this thing complicated. But we wrote a formula and 
here is an the formula is exact for some n around 6500 and i'm just showing it for 750 you can see that p3 uh, p2 of 750 is fairly big and our number converged and it was off by only 0.167 and takes about seven i have a nice implementation it takes 75 seconds okay but after this number if you say ask for 10000 there are some tweaks which can make it work okay so this is the home page of the partitions project and it has some history it has some things and you can uh, you can uh, i'll give a link at the end you can see if you can help me out okay so i will spend another 10 15 minutes uh, to talk about open problems in the partition project that means these are problems where we can work so, <clears throat> this is something called unimodality of partitions in a box. So, the idea is that, uh, so, so let's just think of uh, ordinary partitions. If you look at their young diagrams, these were, uh, you know, we put boxes, so we put the squares. And the idea is that suppose we put a restriction on the thing and say that we'll only look for young diagrams which fit in a box of size say 5 by 5 so that means you can have up to 25 pieces and you shouldn't have pieces going outside that box square okay square is just a thing so we consider partitions whose ferrous diagram fit in a square box of area l square and let p1 of l denote the number of partitions of n that fix in a square box so this is the thing i had in mind okay so <clears throat> Now comes, the, I need the definition, I just forgot, sorry. So if you have a so sequence of numbers, A0, A1 to AD, is called log concave. If if you take one guy and uh, AI square and look at the two terms on the other side, it's greater than that for every term. It's also said to be unimodal if there exists a J such that, so this, I mean, I won't read this thing. I'll just tell you what this means. It says that, you know, what happens is that uh, uh, up to this point J, the entries either remain the same or they increase. So it's weakly increasing and after which it's weakly decreasing. Example of uh, a unimodal uh, classic example is just the binary n choose k. n choose k, which is uh, the binomial coefficients. And if you see that k will go up to n by 2, it will increase and come down. So that's a unimodal sequence for all k equal to 0 to n. So again, here we have chosen all sides to be equal for simplicity, and there's an obvious generalization to unequal sides. But one thing we can see here is that P, if you put it in a box, only you can have a finite number of partitions because the maximum you can put n uh, number of squares, if you think in terms of young diagrams, is L square. So for instance, if you have L equal to 2, we'll call it a binary or Boolean box. You get this P1 of 2 here is just the size of the box of n. It was 1, 1, 2, 1, 1. So you can see it's constant here. It increases in the middle and comes down. So this is exactly, so this sequence is unimodal. It's actually known that P1 for any L, actually any in an unequal thing also, rectangles also, is unimodal. Okay. <clears throat> Similarly, we can obvious generalizations in terms of d-dimensional partitions whose Ferrer's diagram fits in a d plus one dimensional hypercube of size L. And let PD of L denote the number of d-dimensional partitions of L. It's also known for plane partitions also this is true. So for N between 0 to L cube, the sequence is really modern. The proof is a lot harder than the one for partitions. So let's what about solid partitions? We can ask this. The solid partitions in a binary box, that is d equal to 3, l equal to 2, one obtains the following unimodal sequence. Okay, if you add up all these numbers, it comes to 168. It turns out that this number is something called the dedicated number. More on this later. So the conjecture, which is folklore, the sequences p, d, l of n are uh, for, uh, no, this for is not there, are unimodal for all l and d. This is the conjecture. And it's open... This was posed to me by a student of uh, the IFR, a grad PhD student named Pritam. And uh, this is one conjecture, which is an open problem. Okay. So, so now let's just focus on a uh, simpler case. So L equal to 2 is the simplest. This is the kind of conjecture flow curve is much this thing. So let's look at it uh, for just choose the smallest but non-trivial value L equal to 2. So what I did was to, when he asked me, I wrote a program to explicitly compute for D less than L and verified unimodality. 
then comes the surprise. Once you get up a sequence of numbers, you go plug in OES, you can plug in, it will give you a bunch of sequences. It led me to this sequence. A269. I look at it and some of the definitions didn't even make sense to me, but there was an interesting connection. I found that the number of d minus one dimensional particles in a binary box is the same as the number of monotone Boolean functions which map from a d-bit d bit number to 0, 1. So these are Boolean functions, okay, so Boolean variables, so this is d-bits, so each one can take, say, b1, b2, b3, b2, up to bd, these can take values 0 and 1, so you're looking at all functions. And uh, you might know a little bit from Boolean algebra that a Boolean function can be constructed using AND, OR, and NOT gates, okay. But a Boolean function is monotone if it can be constructed using only AND and OR gates, but NOT gate is not allowed. So monotone is a subset of all Boolean functions. And once I had this thing, I could actually prove this conjecture, this proposition. Now it can be very easy to prove. So here is something I was looking at higher dimensional partitions in a binary box and lo and behold, out of the blue came something called monotone Boolean functions. I never heard of it. Or I mean, even if I had heard about it, I forgot it. But I could prove that these two computations are the same. Okay, now that is in number as may other definitions, but it's just the num total number of Boolean functions of, of dimension D. That means a D bit number you're mapping to 0 and 1. And so this, so this in terms of our partitions language, it can be written as, uh, so you can go up to 0, 2 power D, you can write this thing. And it's called the dedicated number. And this appears also in the OEIS. And these numbers are known only for up to 8. So if you remember, we saw 5, uh, yeah, was it 5? Yeah, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. We got 168. This is that number which we got. This is, we took these numbers and added them up. This was our sequence. But you look here, 8 is such a huge number. And beyond the 8, there are only estimates. So M9 is not known. So this is M0, M1, M2, M3, this is M8. In 2016, PD of to n was not known for d greater than 6. So with an undergraduate student, with Yasar Garus from the class of 2019, I computed the numbers for d equal to 7 and verified that it is a unimodal. With another student, Deepak Aditya, his classmate actually, I computed another refinement and that is also a, we contributed to OEIS. So the open problem now is to compute a refinement of this number, which is to compute p7 of 2 which is the refinement of M of it. And uh, so we, Vidya Sagar and I have actually done some preliminary work and this is, I think, an open prob problem, but can be done. So, I mean, it's very, very hard because as you can see, these are fairly big numbers and hope to do it someday. Okay, so this is now, uh, so these are some open problems that we have. And uh, so let's look at the reality of undergraduate research. Uh, research. An important ingredient in research, not just undergraduate research, is failure. This is the most common outcome, with success being rare. While scary, there is no penalty for failure, especially if you're an undergraduate. But even in failures, you learn something. That is insight and knowledge gain. And one more advantage undergraduate students have is they can work on problems that wouldn't, one would not give to graduate students. Why? Graduate students are on time-bound fellowships. They will run out of money after five years. So the partitions project is a classic example of this, where we are going to work on problems which, which, may, which we may not even know how to proceed, but we, failure is fine. I mean, it's an, it's an acceptable option. Actually, failure is an acceptable option for all scientists. And uh, so this is the reality of uh, undergraduate research. There are some issues, I already uh, told you about this. Reliability, undergraduates tend to treat research like homework. Ha, the prof will clean it up. The fix to that is talk to them, uh, fix for, uh, for faculty members, you should talk to them about it. And tell them, look, you have to give us, it's not like submitting a homework, you have to give things which are reliable. And the good ones learn. The first few times they make mistakes, okay. But second one is inconsistency. So they'll work, suddenly you will see them working feverishly on your project and then disappear for few weeks and weeks, even sometimes even months. And that is because undergraduate students are doing a lot of things simultaneously. And so, and there is no fix for that because that's a particular stage in 
people's lives and uh, I, I don't know that there is a fix for it. And But there is also this additional thing, every student is unique and it takes some work, at least on my part, to figure out what their strengths and weaknesses are. And then I give them feedback and I, and many of them, I, I, they found it very useful, useful in a very interesting way, not useful for my project, yeah, maybe, yes, but it actually helped them in their other part of academics. I mean, I remember there's one student who came and did a computation and uh, said, yeah, I looked at it and I said, yeah, I mean, uh, the, but I said, it's not finished. I said, yeah, that's a Gaussian integral. I know how to do it. I said, but you haven't done it. I don't accept that. That you have to finish it, you have to dot every I, cross every T. And actually for him, it turned out, this guy is much smarter than me, obviously. And so he would just reach uh, points where, you know, there are just some trivial algebra, what he called trivial algebra. And he would stop there and uh, leave it. And uh, he would not do well in exams. Because he, they would, you know, you never know. You might think you know how to do it, but sometimes there are some small potholes into which you will trip and fall. And the last place you want to trip and fall is, is, in, a, is in, uh, in an exam setting or whatever. So this kind of, uh, so this is something which I have learned to accept. So I just conclude now with a few remarks. So the partitions project has led to exact enumerations of the largest known numbers in all dimensions greater than two. And these have been contributed to sequences on the online encyclopedia of integer sequences. And when uh, Intel heard that I have world records, as somebody told them, I never thought of it as world records. They actually funded me for one year. They gave me money and said, you do whatever. That was very funny. And I personally have written five papers, some involving undergraduates, some others. They all arose about my learning things in the partition. Okay, so now there are some open projects, projects uh, that could involve undergraduate students, extending the numbers for four-dimensional partitions. Currently, P4 of 45 is the largest number. I think we could go up to 60. Pro proving of unimodality of partitions in a box. I think this is uh, looking impossible. But computing the monotone, uh, number of monotone in Boolean functions or partitions in a binary box, these I think we can do. And this project will actually benefit immensely if more faculty members also join and enhance the scope of the project. Right now, it is just me driving it and there's only one kind of, uh, you know, I, I do, I'm only a single person, I can only do so much. But I'm also a theorist and uh, I have seen our horizon people, there's something called the Center for Innovation. But my question to you people is, should there be a Center for Innovation for theoretical work? Why not? And there's some recent news that uh, IIT Madras, along with its alumni, has introduced something called the IIT Madras Young Research Fellowship. Actually fellowship. And uh, it's aimed at introducing third-year undergraduates to research. So there will be some uh, faculty members giving projects and uh, students will be chosen based on, I don't know how they will be chosen. I'm not involved. Okay. So thank you. And uh, I have given the uh, link the partitions project below and these are the names of some people it's just a bubble of words thank you uh, thank you for that great lecture sir um, there are a few questions on the on the youtube comment section the first one is uh, do the okay. young diagrams correspond to the ones in graph theory uh young diagrams in group theory okay yeah yeah, yeah. So, so irreducible representations of uh, of the permutation group as well as of SUN are classified by giving Young diagrams. Yes. And could you comment further on the uh, the relevance here? Uh, okay. So, uh, well, uh, there isn't uh, the higher dimensional partitions do not. Have, I mean, even plane partitions, there is no group theoretic significance that I know of. Okay, so. The other ones are standard. So involving normal partitions, that is very standard. But beyond this, I think there is, I don't know any. Okay. This was a really eye-opening and uh, intriguing session. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Yeah. No more questions, I guess. No, no more okay. questions. Yeah. Thank, thank you so okay. much. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody.